Here is this man, Cornelius, who was a centurion. In other words, we might say he was kind of a big shot in the Roman army. He was a devout man. He was probably a wealthy man. He had a couple of people that waited on him, and one of them was actually a soldier. So he was well-to-do, we might say, and he had a lot of authority. But nevertheless, he was a man who was doing his best, though he was a Gentile, to serve the Lord. The Bible calls him a God-fearer. Now, this was not necessarily a technical term, although the Jews would often refer to people who were trying to serve God, but they were Gentiles, they weren't Jews, they didn't get circumcised, they didn't go through these basic things. But nevertheless, they honored the Lord and they reverenced God, which is a way to say they feared the Lord. Now, this is the thing that God had his eye on in the life of Cornelius. He also gave alms, the scripture said, to the people. In other words, he was very generous. If they had needs, he helped out. Now, it was at the time when he was fasting, which tells you he was a man that would fast, and undoubtedly he would pray, he would seek the face of God, that an angel appeared unto him and gave him a tremendous word. He told him to go down, and he was going to meet up with a person named Simon Peter. And Simon was staying at this tanner's house, and of course he was up on the roof, because if you were a tanner in those days, oftentimes... You used animal excrement to tan the leather. And I don't blame him. If they're cooking food, I'd probably been on the roof too, getting away from that. But he was up there, and while he was hungry, waiting for them to fix the meal, he fell into a trance, and he saw, as it were, a great sheep came down from heaven, and all these unclean animals, animals that under the Old Testament law would have been forbidden to have partaken of. You couldn't eat these bugs. You couldn't eat these animals that were unclean. But he heard a voice saying, Rise, Peter, slay and eat. And I want you to notice, the scripture said this happened three times. So three times Peter told God no. But it was because it was so deeply entrenched in his heart that Gentiles are unclean. You're not supposed to eat around them. You're not supposed to hang around them. They are unclean people. God is not going to use them, and so on and so forth. So it wasn't even lawful for them to go under their roof and to eat. But nevertheless, when Peter came out of this dream, trance, whatever you want to call it, it was just the Spirit of God was upon him. When he came out of it, he recognized that God is no respecter of persons. And the thing that God looks for in a person is a person that reverences him and that does his will. This is the thing. It doesn't make any difference where you're from. You could be rich, you could be poor, you could be from the other side of the track. It doesn't make any difference what your skin color is, what your nationality is. It makes no difference about any of those things. It doesn't even matter what your occupation is. Because you wouldn't think, well, God is going to find a Roman soldier. As a matter of fact, kind of like a general or, or maybe a colonel in our military today, that he is going to pour his spirit out on a Gentile, that is to say, a non-Jew for the first time. Think of that. For the first time. Up to this point, almost everybody that you read about in the book of Acts being saved is a Jew. You know, it's interesting because today the question is almost, can a Jew be saved? But back then the question was, can a Gentile be saved? And it was true for the first several years of the church. But what I want to emphasize is the type of person that Cornelius was. You say, well, what was God looking for? What made him so special? The scripture said again, he was a man who feared the Lord with all of his house. In other words, his attitude was like in the Old Testament. As for me and my house, we are going to serve the Lord. How many of you know that is important? That is vitally important. As for me and my house, we're going to serve the Lord. And he served God and feared the Lord. He reverenced God with his whole heart. Now think about this for a minute, saints. What is something that we desperately need today? We need to see it not just in the world. We need to see it even in the churches. And that is a reverence for God. How many of you are with me tonight? I remember a time when I was a child 
that during the service, especially during the altar call, there was reverence in the house of God. That's a good place for somebody that's from the old school to shout amen. There was a reverence for God. When a tongues and interpretation went forward, buddy, people snapped to it. And they stopped and listened to what God's saying. But we have lost reverence oftentimes in the house of the Lord. And God's house gets treated like any other house. And we have to be very careful. Especially, saints, when people's souls are on the line. How many of you know when God's dealing with people, we need to let God deal with people? When, when people are down at the altar, it's not time to come bother somebody. When I was a youth pastor, we used to minister in the basement of the church. And sometimes the service would go over a little while. And I would be praying for them and I would be laying hands on these young people. And I mean, we wouldn't be playing around. I mean, we would really be seeking God. And what the parents, you know what, we got to go. They come and drag their children right out. But it could have been God's opportunity to reach that person. And you've got to give God a chance to move. Listen, saints, the devil will do anything he can to destroy and distract people at critical times in a service. And we have got to be careful. We have got to be more wise than that. As a matter of fact, the scripture said concerning Cornelius that he, he, he was the type of guy, he was a God-fearer. This meant he was somebody who would have went, scholars tell us, tell us, to the synagogue. And knowing that he was a Gentile, he would have had to have been very respectful of everything in the service. He had to have been very respectful of what they were doing. Why was that? Because he honored the Lord in the way that he lived. You know, I remember back in the day, people would have thought, you know what, I act out in the service, I'm going to be struck dead. But people don't think that way anymore. They have no thought like that at all. They have no, no concern in that regard whatsoever. But see, Cornelius was the type of person, he would have went to the synagogue, he would have been respectful, he would have done what he needed to do in order to show reverence for God. He would pray, he would fast, he would do all of this, not just him, but his whole house. He taught his children to respect the Lord. He taught his children to reverence God. One of the things that I have a real hard time with, saints, and I'm, I'm not getting down on anybody, but I have a really hard time during church when you give kids toys to play with. How many of you know, saints, listen, people say, well, the kids won't mind. No, listen, I'll tell you what. I was nine years old and I was brought to church. My parents didn't even come. They just came and brought me and my brother. He was seven, I was nine. They set us on the front row and we were expected to mind. Now there's some old school language. Hmm? Expected to mind. And we didn't get up. We didn't act out. We may go to the bathroom. But I'll tell you what, when the service, God started moving, we got, we sat as still as we could sit. And we, we were like, you know what? God is moving in this service. And we need to be careful. I remember one time, and, and these things, saints, listen, have to be taught. They have to be taught. Because a lot of times people don't know better. But I remember this happening. I remember they were passing around the implements for communion. And I remember my cousin was like, I want to drink. I'm thirsty. How many know it's not time to be thirsty during communion? Now that's common sense to us. But the child had to be taught. I mean, with me. They had to be taught that this is representative of the blood of Christ. This is representative of his body. We don't believe in transubstantiation, but these implements are uniquely set apart in this meeting for that purpose. And you have to teach kids reverence. You have to teach them to honor the Lord. And that is what Cornelius did. Him and his whole house honored God. They brought him to church. They brought him to the meeting or to the synagogue. Then he brought them together. So what happened? They all gathered together. They're all in the house. The scripture said they were waiting for Peter to show up. They were waiting. They were anticipating. Here comes the man of God. You know, I could just imagine, maybe if you're one of the children, what are we doing? Dad saw a vision. What do you mean? He said an angel stood in the room. And the angel said, you need to send for this man. And here's the man that he said to send. Now, I'll tell you what, that would have made the hair stand up on your arms. When suddenly this person comes out, and you never even knew who this person was. And here they come walking through the door. And you realize this is exactly what dad said was going to happen. And then it happened. What are they doing? They came in. Peter tells them, say, you know what? I'm not even supposed to be in here. But God showed me up on the roof that I shouldn't treat anybody, you know, that, that he respects 
people, as long as they fear the Lord and do righteousness and all these different things, he said that God is no respecter of persons. So what did he do? He started preaching the gospel. He started telling them about Jesus. He said, you already know about Jesus. You've already heard this message. He said, but I'm here to confirm it. And as he was speaking to them, the scripture said that the Holy Spirit fell on that house. And they all began to speak with tongues, just like on the day of Pentecost. Think of that. They began to speak in tongues, just like on Pentecost, which is almost like God putting his stamp on here and saying, these are my people. I'm going to use these people. And that's what he was doing. And it just blew away the circumcision, that is the believing cir circumcision, that God had poured his spirit out on the Gentiles in the same way that he did the Jews. But the question that I have for you tonight is, why did God choose Cornelius and his house? What made him unique among all the Gentiles in the world? God could have chose a lot of people. It was because he feared the Lord. He reverenced God with all of his heart, with all of his house. He did alms. In other words, he helped people. He was a generous person. And he was the type of person that God could minister to. He honored the Lord. He reverenced the Lord. You know, it's a dangerous thing, saints, to have a flippancy towards God. Did you know that the Bible speaks more of the fear of the Lord than the love of God? That would blow you away in the year 2000, wouldn't it? But the Bible speaks more about it. Did you know in the book of Acts, the word love is not mentioned one time? Not once. You say, did God show love? Yeah, he was showing his love by loving them, but that's not what they preached. And it's important to understand this. They had a reverence for God. They had an honor for God, and they wanted to do God's will. When you talked about God, they didn't view God like anyone else. They viewed him as he truly is. And as a result of that, notice what happened again. The spirit of God was poured out and they began to speak with other tongues. And from this point forward, saints, the Gentiles now become part of the church. It used to just be Jews. The Gentiles were over here. But now they are part of the church moving forward. What a powerful thing. What an awesome thing to consider. What a powerful thing. You know, saints, I believe that in this day and age that we need to teach, we need to minister along these same lines. There is nothing wrong with teaching and ministering the fear of the Lord if we do it with the love of God. When you talk about the love of God, listen, I've written two books on the love of God. I believe in the love of God. But here's the thing. We have to have the reverential fear of God with it as well. I used to teach the young people when I was youth pastor. I would tell them things like this. When the love of God runs out in your life, the fear of God has to kick in. When you won't not do such and such because you don't love God enough to behave, the fear of God needs to kick in to keep you on the rails. You see what I'm saying? And sometimes people don't feel a love for God. It's not keeping their behavior right. But if they have a healthy fear of God, they will think twice before they do certain things. And I think that is a good thing. And that's the type of person Cornelius was. And this is why I believe God used him. His family was prepared. They were ready. When the man of God came to speak, they were already there. I doubt you had a bunch of chaos in the house. When Peter started to speak, he didn't even need a microphone. You could have heard a pin drop because they wanted to hear what the man of God had to say because they were hanging on every word. What is God saying to us? Somebody go to say something. Shh, we're trying to hear what God is saying. And that's how I think things went. Cornelius, centurion, Roman soldier, probably a wealthy man, has all these th different things that we could probably say, God did never use a guy like him. But God was looking at different criteria than what we look at or what man looks at. He was looking at his heart and he had a right attitude towards the Lord and it made him useful for God. Saints, I wanna be used of God. In the book of Proverbs, the Bible says that the reverential fear of God is the beginning of wisdom. It's the beginning. It's the beginning of understanding. And we have to have that. If we don't have that, it will be chaos. There will be no honor for God. 
There'll be no reverence for God. We'll never see any people getting saved or anything like that. We need to have an honor for the Lord. Father, we're just so grateful. We're grateful for the life of Cornelius, who was an example. To